Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking to John Spates, who is the screenwriter of Dune. And, you know, when you first came into this process, there was an initial draft of a script that Eric Roth had written and Denis had also worked on. Um, and then you came on board. And, and I was really interested in, in the process at this point where you came on board and wrote an entirely separate draft, but then put the two of them side by side to kind of create a cohesive one, which really brought elements of the two together. So I was really interested in, in kind of how that was really helpful for you to look at what they'd done, but to write something completely new and then how you kind of found the marriage between those two versions. It was a fascinating process. Sometimes I get nerdy and I just need to deeply understand the structure of what's in front of me. So when they came to me, I talked to Denis about it. We shared a love for Dune and a desire to be faithful to it. I read the hybrid draft that Eric and Denis created together. Um, it was full of great stuff. They felt it wasn't quite there yet. And I had to ask myself, well, what is Dune? I'm really, just what's in there? And I, I knew the book immensely well, having read it as a kid and reread it every summer vacation growing up for a long time. Um, but I still learned a lot. I sat down with it and a red pen. And I, I think I made an Excel spreadsheet where I just itemized scenes mm -hmm. and beat out the first half of the novel that was going to be the stuff of the film. And I discovered things that I, for all that I memorized the dialogue and scene after scene, I, I discovered things I had never noticed. Uh, for example, there's a stretch of major scenes that every Dune fan will recall um, in the first act of the book. And I had never realized that they're all set in the same room. Mm -hmm. And Paul Atreides just hangs out there and characters walk in and have a big conversation with him or they have sword fighting practice with him or another, they, they give a medical checkup and they talk about the environment of Dune and people keep coming and going. And he never leaves the space. It's like a black box stage play. Um, and of course, cinematically, you've got to move things around a little more than that. Um, there's also a funny way in which all of the big epic moments of action in the novel take place off stage, uh, which again feels like Shakespeare, where it sort of points off to the wings, like, look at that great battle, 10,000 men dashing themselves against the castle. You've never seen such a thing. Um, and Dune is written like that. The Atreides go to bed on... Arrakis free and they wake up prisoners and the invasion has happened while they slept and we hear about bits of it um, from anecdote and from people recollecting thereafter. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, they close a chapter packing their bags on Caladan and the next time you see them, they're unpacking on Arrakis and the whole journey to another star, you skip over and they kind of fill it in a little bit with recollections and comments. So I had to learn that by diagramming the book. Um, and then I did my adaptation, which was very straight um, and really just involved some critical omissions where it felt like not everything was going to fit. Um, and then the side by side was just the best idea wins things, looking at how they and I had threaded the, the maze of the book's structure similarly or differently. And in particular, in the draft that Denis had worked on, there were places where you could just see his fingerprint and you could see him filmmaking on the page. He had a vision, he was pursuing something. Everything like that went straight in. Um, and so we made this amalgam draft that um, was I think refreshed by a, a new infusion of straight Frank Herbert, like the, the, the novel itself kind of reasserted the form and shape, um, but all of their visual inventions and creativity was still in it. And then Denis and I went into a kind of collaborative process where we honed that script together over the course of a couple of months while he was busily prepping the movie. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. And, and you're mentioning there kind of like with that idea of diagramming the, the book and, and all of the different scenes for the script, and you were touching upon having a spreadsheet to do that. Is that something that was really specific to, you know, the fact that you were creating a new draft and this is an adaptation? Or are there moments where when you're writing an original screenplay as well and working on that sort of material, that it's really helpful structurally to create that kind of format before you dive into writing some of the pages? I find I need information management tools often when I'm writing, but rarely the same way twice. Yeah. And it's very much a function of the story. 
Uh, sometimes I draw big idea maps on a whiteboard. Sometimes I need a stack of index cards. Sometimes I need a timeline. Um, it depends what I'm doing. Uh, in, uh, in writing what became Prometheus, uh, I had two different ships down on an alien planet and so many characters moving back and forth between them that to keep track of everybody, I built a kind of board game uh, where I had tokens for all the characters and the two ships marked out. And I was moving them back and forth and just trying to track the power dynamics to make sure that I knew where everybody was and wasn't forgetting everyone and that everything played right. I've never done that before or since, but that's what I needed to get through Prometheus. Mm-hmm. And in in making an adaptation of this book, and you were bringing up there how familiar you were with the book, was that a really valuable thing to you in terms of almost being able to like not open the book and be combing through the pages and looking at details, but knowing the spirit and the essence of what you were trying to capture instead of it being about specific elements on the page? Yes. Um, At the time I was brought on, the studio knew when they wanted to make the movie and they were running tight to have a script that they felt was ready. Um, so they needed me to go fast. And I did my first, my first draft in six weeks or slightly under. Um, if I had to pick up Dune Cold and read this 700 page novel filled with dense world building, I simply don't think I could have done it. I mean, I'd have taken a stab at it, um, but it just takes time to digest a work that long. Um, and even having read it once and comprehended it reasonably well, I would definitely not be so fluent as I am as a person who's reread it many times. So yeah, the fact that I was already a fan gave me options that I could not possibly have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to talk about the exposition because obviously in terms of the, the scope of a story like this, when you see it on screen, there's so much detailing that goes into the world building aspect of it. And yet it still always feels about the intimacy and the connection of the characters. You know, what is the family dynamic? What is this father son dynamic? What does that mean for the story? But you still kind of have to create what those exposition elements are going to be. And so what are the challenges in terms of making sure that you have enough and that you're giving the audience the rules of the world in science fiction, but not leaning too heavily in that direction and always bringing it back to character? Yeah, it is the great challenge of Dune, that the world building is so dense. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's a solid movie just in explaining how everything works. (laughs) Um, Not a movie that everybody would go see, but you could make one. Um, So the challenge there was economy and the refining principle was character. There were moments where we tried to do what the novel does and pause to explain to the audience how certain parts of the universe work. And every time we tried it, the movie sat down, felt static, it felt like a lesson. Even if you try to do it in the context of, you know, a sword fight or an argument or something else that holds interest, um, we still felt energy bleeding away. And, So in the end, it just became a matter of removing everything, of doing as little exposition as possible and providing information only where it was essential to understanding the journey these characters were on, the jaws of the trap that was closing on them, uh, the differences between them as they argued about how to best navigate the maze they were in. Um, So our solution to the question of exposition was not to do it wherever possible. And I think, honestly, that is the the best approach in any form of storytelling. I think movies in general these days explain themselves over much. Um, We should have more faith in the ability of audiences to find their way into actions in midstream and catch up on the fly, the same way we do in real life, uh, walking into new scenarios and coming to understand who all these players are, what all these people want, what they're like. I think it's exhilarating as an audience member to feel the movie trusts you to catch up and is galloping along without you and you learn as you go. Um, And more than that, I think in every form of storytelling and not just sci-fi or genre storytelling, mystery is beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
and wondering a little bit about what people are up to, where they're going, what lies between them feels good, feels real. It allows characters complexity because your mind fills in what you cannot see. Uh, and over explaining can stifle that. So I think there's also an artistic service that's performed when you allow the world building stuff to be handled by implication or by poetic devices as much as by little speeches about how things work. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting to hear you say that because one of the notes that I'd actually scribbled down while watching the film was that it has a real respect for the audience and that's very clear in the telling of it. And, you know, does how does that inform some of the structure when you're writing scenes where you don't necessarily need to kind of, like you were saying, you don't need to bring the audience in like at the beginning, you can bring them in partway through and they're going to catch up and have a sense of what's going on. And you don't need to give them 10 details before two conversation, two characters enter a conversation or a dialogue with one another. So how does that influence a lot of the structure of scenes with that respect in mind? I wish I was so slick that I could out of the gate right that way, giving the audience only what they need. Um, invariably, the first time you write a scene that bumps up against a piece of world building that seems to want explanation, uh, you don't know yet exactly how much of that explanation will be borne by earlier scenes. So you tend to do it all on that scene where you first meet the thing. And then that device will return halfway through the movie. You write another scene about it and you're like, oh, I can talk about it some here. And maybe I don't need all that stuff up front because I can do it here in this scene. And so you'll cut some. And that process that I call exposition Jenga is an inevitable part of completing a first draft. And then every iteration you do after that, you're going to find that you've explained stuff you didn't need to explain because later moments will explain it or even better actions will explain it. And you don't need to say it because by the time you've watched two hours of this movie, the behavior of the people has shown you the shape of the world and no one needs to call it out out loud. And that is, of course, the holy grail. If you can use pure cinema uh, to show people the shape of things, and no one needs to give a little lesson on it. Mm -hmm. And that idea also comes into play a lot into regards of the fact the book is very internalized. And most of the time when you have a very internalized book, it becomes very externalized on screen. And yet one of the really striking elements of this adaptation is it, retrain, it retains that internalization and allows the audience to do some of the work the way that you concoct certain images when you're reading a book. We also get to in watching the film, even though it's a visual medium, which is a really interesting approach and really adds an interesting layer to the viewing experience. Um, you know, was that fairly easy to find where you wanted to have those moments where you're kind of pulling back on, on visuals and, and thinking about the ways in which the audience are going to fill in a lot of what's happening, particularly when it comes to Paul's visions. We don't, you know, we see aspects of it, but we don't see kind of like a constant role of like the different images that he's seeing and, and what's coming across his mind. No, it's very difficult. Um, and of course, Denis is deeply involved in these decisions. He told me early on that his ideal Dune was a wordless Dune. Um, just a pure poetry of images, um, an unattainable ideal, but a great lodestone to follow. Um, and so there are several approaches that we took and we took them all at once, meaning that some of what happens in the novel in interior monologue is so essential that you've got to find some way of externalizing that information. And so you find some little line of dialogue, some little tweaks, some way to surface that. You have characters um, argue. Uh, arguments are nice because they're one of the few places in life where we organically say things to one another that we both know already. Um, I've been working here for a year. I pack lunch every day. And, you know, these are things we both know, but I'm making a point. And so I say so. They're great expositional tools because they're organic places where, as opposed to like, <laughs> <laughs> that thing we see in movies like Teddy you're my brother I would never leave you behind like we don't know Teddy is his brother um you got to look for places where that sort of stuff feels organic you know a, a nice way of letting the audience know that Teddy's your brother is a little more real is that hey I talked to mom how is she well now we're both calling her mom that's probably my brother and I think that's more the way in real life we learn these things so you try to find those you try to find the most organic and minimalist ways of externalizing interior information. 
um, and where you can dramatize things with action and with imagery, you do it that way. And then the scariest way is you just leave it on the inside and you make the leap of faith that the audience is going to get it. They're going to come with you as long as the actors know what it means and your director knows what it means. Um, then the meaning will infuse the scene and the audience will get it. And it's gratifying and amazing to see how much they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're bringing up there that one of the key components of that is the director has to get it. And this was such a collaboration, you know, in the way that you worked with Denis, which is, you know, I don't need to tell you as a writer, very often not the case. And I loved hearing that the two of you would be sitting and writing on, working on the script, talking about story, talking about character, you know, while he was in pre-production that the two of you would sit there and work on pages and work on beats of the story for several hours a day. And then while he was off in pre-production, you know, you could then know the answers to what he wanted and how he was envisioning the film. But also at that point, if he's having conversations with the rest of the crew and the rest of the department heads and making visual choices, you then also have that to add into your work as a writer, um, which right. often doesn't get to be part of that. And so how does that completely change the experience and what the collaboration with a director is for you? And, and how does that really help in terms of just making the script richer because you're able to get the answers and really kind of make the script exactly what the director needs it to be from their end as well? The, the process is invaluable. I love writing during prep mm -hmm. um, because of exactly that, because there's a two-way street between you and other creatives and there are designers and production uh, concept artists and, um, and of course your director, uh, all driving forward to refine the vision at the same time. And any Congress between you produce these, these beautiful synergies uh, in the work. Uh, for example, in Dune part one, there's a moment when Paul and Jessica find refuge in an old research station in the desert with Liette Kynes. Mm -hmm. Duncan Idaho is there. And I had a sort of vague vision in my head of that from the book. Uh, but then Denis brought in this piece of concept art of what he was imagining that space. Um, and it was enormous. It was a far larger volume than I would ever have had the cheek to imagine this research station being this colossal cavern open to the sky. Um, and it completely changed the way I saw the scene. And at the bottom of that drifted cavern, there was, uh, at the bottom of that giant canyon, there was drifted sand. And that created a moment where the invading Sardaukar floated down into the space and the Fremen leapt up in ambush from underneath the sand, which I wouldn't have, I wouldn't imagine sand in that space if I had not seen that picture, but suddenly there was sand and I used it and it became sort of the thrust of the central action of that set piece. And I love that. And that only happens because we were in the feedback loop of creatives driving together toward a goal. And of course, working with your director at your elbow, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And with the visuals and the way that, that Denis has filmed this, he's really captured this very fraught landscape, but that feels very close to, you know, the landscape now. And there's certain elements that feel a little bit more science fiction, a little bit more futuristic, but it still all feels very familiar to audiences. Um, you know, and, and even the effects, the majority of, of what we see is all in camera. You know, mm -hmm. there's very little in terms of, of CGI that's coming into play. Was that, you know, useful for you in terms of, of the writing process or how did that influence some of the, the details that you were working on, particularly kind of going back to some of the exposition, some of the language of building the world for the audience? The commitment to making everything as real as possible is also a commitment not to alienate the audience mm -hmm. uh, with devices that come between them and the work. Um, there is, of course, an enormous amount of beautiful CG in Dune, um, the landscapes, the deserts, and so forth. And even the biggest sets um, he shot on are often extended or have elements added to them. But he is deeply committed to the real. And so these extraordinary props and sets were made and made beautifully. And wherever possible, uh, when shooting people out in the landscape and exposed to sunlight, even if he's necessarily shooting in projection because 
you can't really fly as ornithopters over a sandworm. Um, he shot in real daylight as much as possible. So all those ornithopter scenes and so forth are shot out of doors in ornithopter shells that are beautifully built and designed and physically real um, that in turn are in motion on a series of rigs that will either tilt them on a gimbal as if they were flying and pivot them so that the shadows can change as if they were really flying with respect to the sun. Uh, or in the case of a crash, sliding along rails to throw a bow wave of sand and physically moving. So tons of extension and CG in those scenes, but at the heart of it, real physical reality um, with the actors actually moving through space in the ways they're being called upon to move. I think that underlies the deep feeling of reality that the film provides. Um, you don't write very differently to it, but the aesthetic gets inside you and you realize that you're trying to write a stark and real world rooted in physical reality. And so that, and, and a human reality, because this is a world filled with strange laws and strange customs, uh, but where the people are flesh and blood, men and women like you and me, and they do the things that we would do. They feel like we feel. And so you ground it in human reality and physical reality. It just pairs away certain flights of fancy um, that might serve to alienate the audience. You're grounded in the real. Mm -hmm. one, one of the scenes kind of going back to what we were talking about before in terms of the audience doing the work that I wanted to ask you about was the scene where Paul has his hand in the box of pain because, you know, that's such a great example of, of not giving the audience everything and yet the audience feels absolutely everything. Was that quite a challenging scene to write because of all the, the delicacy and, and balance that comes with trying to create that essence for the audience in that moment on the page? The hardest part about that scene was all the jobs it's doing um, in the book uh, because it's quite a talky scene in the book and there's a bunch of exposition that gets done there. And so in your first approximation, you're trying to do justice to all of that material, but ultimately it becomes too much. And so you have to decide what matters. It's also a scene um, like many, and it gets to the interiority of Dune as a novel. It's one more scene in which Paul's job is to hold still and say nothing, which is not very cinematic. It happens again when the hunter seeker comes into his bedroom and tries to kill him and he has to hold still and say nothing. And he's abducted by the Harkonnens who think he's asleep and they throw him in an ornithopter and he has to hold still and say nothing. And in the novel, every time that happens, we're on the roller coaster ride of his internal monologue. And we're hearing his perceptions, his deductions, his plan, his assessments of the weaknesses of his opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, but in cinema, all of that is opaque to us. And so the question is, how do you externalize those conflicts and make those moments rich, even though you're just looking at a person not move? And you do a little bit about it by framing things in dialogue. Uh, some of it you get done by casting Timothée Chalamet, which I strongly recommend to everyone, because um, uh, I think his performance in the Gom Jabbar scene is mind bending. Um, and it's an easy scene to get wrong. Uh, either by overshooting or undershooting. And I think he his work is extraordinary there. Um, and then you construct as much as you can drama that tells the internal story outwardly. Um, in the Gum Jabbar scene, the major job is getting out of the way, uh, was of pairing away the world building, the exposition, the sparring, um, and letting the electricity between Rampling and Chalamet carry the scene. Mm -hmm. And we're also, you know, with the character of Paul, we're so much journeying through so many aspects of the film with him mm -hmm. as a character and, you know, hearing about things peripherally as he's hearing about them peripherally and then experiencing them as he's experiencing them. And so how does that inform a lot of the structure of the script for you as well? Well, the ghost story is important to me. Um, there's often a Hollywood push to, again, pamper the audience by introducing things to them earlier that they might need to know later. Uh, but I'm really fond of ghost stories uh, where you hear about something for a while before it comes along and you get to build a sense of anticipation for it, just a sense of mystery, a thing gets mentioned and you think, what's that? Um, and then it gets mentioned again and it seems important to people like, oh, what is this thing? And then along it comes and you've built up a sense of anticipation. Um, Dune is 
constructed of many of those little pathways where you hear the ghost stories of things before they come along. And I think they're wonderful dramatic engines. So the great thing there was that we were just given the creative freedom to tell the story that way. Mm -hmm. That's really, really wonderful to hear. Well, you know, huge congratulations on everything with the film and really, really appreciate you talking so in depth about it. It's been really fascinating to hear so many of the aspects that went into creating this entire visual world on screen. So thank you so much, John. Oh, real pleasure. Thank you for your wonderful questions.